On this edition of Independent Sources, Latino media in decline. Why is it shrinking while the Spanish-speaking population is growing? I think that pan-ethnic approach, it might work within mainstream media to represent Latinos, I think, but when we're talking about like the Spanish language press and ethnic presses overall, that approach is not as, as effective because people are looking for much more specific local regional news. And a mother's crusade. A search for justice leads to a landmark victory in the fight against terrorism. That mother in me, it rose up and that, you know, overtook me, where it just was, you know, deeply, a deep sense of, I have to, you know, I have to get justice for my son. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The plug has been pulled at NBC Latino and the lights turn off at CNN Latino. Now, El Diario, the city's venerable Spanish language newspaper, is coming under fire for being out of touch with its audience. The closures and criticisms have shed light on the increasing struggles facing Latino media outlets trying to speak to the more than 53 million Hispanics living in the United States. So why are they falling short, and what does the Latino audience want? I try to find answers to these and other questions in my conversation Hi, with Columbia, Professor Jillian Baez, an expert on media culture. Jillian, welcome to the show. After going through a wonderful year celebrating its 100th year anniversary, El Diario de Prensa, the city's largest and oldest Spanish publication appears to be going backward. What's going on? So there are a number of things that are going on at El Diario. I think one of the issues has been um, the change in ownership. In terms of a few years ago, El Diario no longer was um, running independently. It was now merged um, with a number of other large Spanish language newspapers through this parent company called Impremedia. Um, so it's one of the things that has changed. Um, and the other major thing is uh, there has been a huge change in terms of the editor-in-chief. Um, and of course, that has affected um, not only production and distribution, but also the kinds of content that we've seen. What's happening with the content? I mean, is, is it getting better, or is, is it losing its edge? What's going on there? It's lost some of its traction. Um, I think part of that is due to the fact that within this larger company, Impremedia, a lot of the content that is produced is not just for El Diario's regional market, right, which, which historically has been, you know, serving the Latino community within New York City. Um, but it's actually recycling, using a lot of the same stories that it's using for the other papers. So, for example, if you look at um, one of the other papers that Impremedia owns, um, La Opinion, which is a in very LA, large, in yes, Los Angeles, exactly. Yeah. They're running a lot of the same content. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the major differences. Um, of course, some of the content, you know, El Diario still claims, which is true, is 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 more regionally focused in terms of New York, um, but not all of it. And I think that that's been one of the major criticisms, really, of El Diario in the present. Now, ownership media ownership changes all the time and you don't have the kind of uh, uh, disruption that you were seeing. Is there anything particular? It, because the new ownership is from Argentina. Is there resentment here among sort of like the, the Caribbean based uh, Latinos here who, who really resent this uh, Argentine ownership? Some of the criticism actually has been um, that some of the content pushes out uh, some of the more sort of um, Caribbean and Afro-Latino perspectives because of this new ownership, because it's more focused um, on one, this kind of pan-ethnic audience, this larger Latino audiences where distinctions aren't made, um, but also, uh, you know, to be quite frank, on a much more um, wider Latino experience. This is really a, a good point that you raised because uh, we see, it seems to me that the, the Latino media in general in the city, uh, the, the publications are struggling to, to uh, get <laughs> traction. So now, can you have a, a pan-Latino publication, or does it have to be, in this case, a, a country uh, base? Sure, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of 
the, that's one of the issues with El Diario, right, is that it's, it's going this more pan-ethnic route when historically um, it has certainly been open to a number of Latino ethnicities, but, has, but the coverage has been much more Puerto Rican, <laughs> yes. And then, That's you know, the last 10 is. years or so, including maybe Dominicans a little mm -hmm. bit more and then Mexicans, and certainly they've upped their coverage of immigration, for example, to serve some of these communities. Um, so, no, I think that that, and, and I think that has driven some audiences away. I mean, I think, of course, they're dealing with some issues that um, all newspapers are dealing with. So, for example, like the migration of readers online, because there's so much free online news. Whether that's good or not is a whole debate. Um, and Latino audiences certainly are going online um, to read more news, even if it's just on their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's, that's one, of, you know, one of the major issues I would definitely say is that I think that pan-ethnic approach, it might work within mainstream media to represent Latinos, I think, but when we're talking about like the Spanish language press and ethnic presses overall, that approach is not as, as effective because people are looking for much more specific local regional news. But at the same time, we've seen uh, CNN, Fox, uh, and, and, and other major networks start and close l Latino uh, publications or programs. It, again, what's going on? Why is there such a rush to you know, capitalize on the Latino market, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, they're not doing it right? It's not happening. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, and a lot of a lot of these outlets have claimed that, you know, and I'm thinking here of things like NBC Latino or C CNN, CNN's Latino Venture, um, have said that they've shut down because their audiences in the end were not large enough. Um, I, I don't know. Some of this is they're targeting this very, um, very kind of, you know, specific niche market. Likewise, explain to us. So, for example, you know, they're just looking at sort of one segment of the larger audience, right, this Latino audience. And I think that a lot of the content, um, you know, if you look at it, was either translated news, so news that, that we would have seen in the Spanish language press just translated mm -hmm. into English or bilingual versions. Um, or there was, there, were some, there was some coverage of the Latino experience within the U.S., and I think that that is what audiences are really, I would say most Latino audiences are really craving. Um, but I, I would say, I guess it just wasn't, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, I also wonder, too, uh, you know, in terms of publicity and promotion, um, how much of the Latino audience was really aware of those ventures? Mm -hmm. But, again, it's, it's a lot of uh, contradiction in many ways. When you have uh, Univision and Telemundo that are so successful, yet uh, the, the, the Eng English network attempt at reaching Latino audiences mm -hmm. failed, and the uh, local Latino publications are not doing as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, what gives? Well, I think that there's a lot going on here because there are, you know, the Latino audience in and of itself is a bit fractured. Mm -hmm. So historically, right, we've always talked about this Latino audience. We've assumed them to be, you know, Spanish speakers, usually first generation, maybe second generation. And we assume that they heavily consume, you know, Spanish language media. That used to be the model. And certainly there are a number of Latino audiences that do fit that profile. What's happened in the last five years or so, though, is some of these outlets that we're talking about, right, like NBC and CNN, have recognized that there are Latinos that are second generation, that are third generation, that might be bilingual or English dominant, um, and want sort of different kinds of content, not only in terms of language, but um, literally in terms of format. Um, so maybe not, for example, just telenovelas, but other kinds of, right, they've experimented with things like reality TV, for example. Um, so I think that that's, that's where that, that push is coming from. I think the problem is it just hasn't been successful so far. Some of that is that this part of the segment of the Latino audience that I'm talking about, that second plus generation, um, and is bilingual or English dominant, they're also consuming a lot of English language mainstream media. Yeah, there was so they're a sort few of vying research. for yeah. Yeah, their attention, mm -hmm. um, and they just have not been successful at what reaching about at, that. What about at the local level? I mean, there's weekly publications or uh, websites that serve, let's say, Queens or a section of Queens. Do you think there's a room for, for them to, to grow or to succeed where others have failed? I think that there is room to grow in certain ways. I think that, you know, with this, with sort of the younger generation in particular, um, a lot of those very local publications that we're talking about, right in the boroughs, I'm thinking of there are publications like this in the Bronx or Queens, um, yes, <laughs> right, and right all over the city, um, even Staten Island. Um, I think that 
some of us have been migrating online and have been doing quite well within social media, right? Because they're able to be distributed, sure. you know, in a mu at, at a much bigger level than they are on the local level, um, in person. So I think that there is an opportunity there. I mean, it's yet to be seen um, in terms of, you know, one of the things that I think these, very, these much smaller papers face is just um, making themselves known. Sometimes people who even live in those boroughs may not be aware of them. Um, so I think, but I think it's a possibility. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Jillian Baez. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Still to come on the show, a death that became a defining moment in the fight against terrorism. Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. A new law that requires city council and other city government entities to broadcast public meetings is hitting a few bumps. Local Law 103, or the Webcast Law, calls for city agencies, committees, commissions, and the city council to post videos of their public meetings online within 72 hours. But the Gotham Gazette finds that there's some confusion about who must abide by the law, when the webcasting should begin, and how the service would be paid for. From the Amsterdam News, a new study finds that abortion rates among black women in New York City are at an all-time high. According to the study done by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, there were over 24,000 live births recorded in 2012 compared to over 30,000 abortions among black women ages 15 to 49. Anti-abortion activists say that more young black women have access to the procedure and that's led to the high rates. Many Irish parents in Queens are opposing a new proposal to have their children bust to another school. The Department of Education is planning to bus kindergarten and first grade students from PS11 in Woodside to PS171 in Astoria for the upcoming school year. This while the DOE builds an addition to PS11 to add over 300 extra seats. Though most parents are for the new construction, the Irish Voice spoke to many who disagree with having the youngest students bust three miles away. They say that older students should be bused instead because younger children could suffer emotional damage from the experience. News India Times profiled Mira Joshi, the first Indian American to head the New York City's Taxi and Limousine Commission, TLC. Joshi is a lawyer who previously worked as a general counsel for the TLC. She's one of several Indian Americans that Mayor Bill de Blasio has appointed to high positions. The list also includes Dr. Ramanathan Raju, New York City's Commissioner of Health and Hospitals Corporation. And finally, the forward profiled an Indian Jewish artist who uses her skills to celebrate other Indian Jews. Siona Benjamin, a New Jersey-based classically trained artist, grew up in Mumbai among other Indian Jews. In 2011, she received a Fulbright scholarship to interview, photograph, and document several of the 5,000 Jews in Mumbai, including a community chef who takes pride in making Indian Jewish dishes. The result of her work is a series of photo collage paintings titled Faces, Weaving Indian Jewish Narratives. The project will be on display at the Floman Hath Gallery in Chelsea until April 26th. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. 20 years ago, New Yorkers were already aware of their vulnerability to terrorism. In 1993, militants made their first attack on the World Trade Center. Still, authorities failed to see a terrorist conspiracy when several Hasidic Jews were gunned down in New York in 1994. That incident changed the course of one Brooklyn mother's life forever. Nikki Miller tells us more about her journey. The Brooklyn Bridge, a world-famous New York landmark. Thousands of commuters use it every day and don't give it a second thought. But for Devorah Halberstam of Crown Heights, it's a painful reminder. Her son was murdered here. Losing that first child, it's like your whole family breaks down. It's everything before and after. And things on will never, ever be the same again, and they never were the same again. Bullets tear into a van on the Brooklyn Bridge. Four young Jewish students are hit. 20 years ago, on March 1st, 1994, 
a van load of 15 Chabad Lubavitch Orthodox Jewish students were gunned down on the Brooklyn Bridge by Lebanese-born immigrant and livery cab driver Rashid Baz. Four students were shot. 16-year-old Ari Halberstam was shot in the head and died four days later. As a mother, do you think the thoughts of when he was laying on the ground? I've asked this so many times. Was he freezing? When they cut open his jacket, it was a frigid day that March 1st. There was ice on the ground. I still could remember the crunching of the ice under my feet when I walked into the hospital. And that's all I can think of, was somebody holding him, was somebody embracing him. I had promised Ari I would take him on a trip to Disneyland. And uh, this is maybe a year before he died. Ari was known in the family as the cool dude, the oldest of Halberstam's five children. He was very charming and he was handsome to a fault. I mean, he really was. He, you noticed him when he walked down the street, he was quick and athletic and he didn't walk down the street, he always hopped down the street. Ari and his family were part of the Hasidic Orthodox community known as Chabad. They were particularly devoted to their grand rabbi, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who had many thousands of followers throughout the world. Ari's father took care of the Rebbe's personal life and Ari felt a very strong bond. They felt they were like the surrogate children. He was like a grandchild to them. So it came as no surprise when Ari decided to join the motorcade of followers to the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital, where the Rebbe was having minor surgery and they could hold a prayer vigil for their spiritual leader. After the surgery, the Rebbe was put back in an ambulance and everyone prepared to go home to Brooklyn. But Ari never made it home. The shooter, Rashid Baz, was captured the following day. In his sentencing, his defense team portrayed him as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, triggered by what had occurred in Israel a few days earlier. In Hebron, specifically at the time, a Jewish settler had walked into a mosque killing 29 Arabs. And there were calls for revenge from that part of the world um, where there would be blood will run like the rivers Jordan. And the calls for revenge were from the most moderate countries of the Middle East to the most extreme countries. Bas was convicted of second degree murder and 14 additional counts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to 141 years to life in prison. But for Halberstam, it wasn't enough. That mother in me, it rose up and that, you know, overtook me, where it just was, you know, deeply, a deep sense of, I have to, you know, I have to get justice for my son. She found she was a quick study. There wasn't a single hearing or one aspect of the case that she didn't educate herself about. Her mission? to have officials reclassify the Brooklyn Bridge shooting as an act of terrorism. They're very clear on the def if somebody shoots a civilian population in order to make a political statement, which is exactly what Rashid Baz did, it falls into the category. And so I began a, you know, call it a crusade. A crusade that led to the passage of Ari's law a comprehensive New York state law controlling gun trafficking, as well as getting the Brooklyn Bridge ramp named for her son, the Ari Halberstam Memorial Ramp, all in the hopes of getting the FBI to review the case. The case was eventually reopened. Right here we have um, the updates where Ari's, where the Brooklyn Bridge shooting and the murder of my son is documented. In December of 2000, the FBI finally reclassified the Brooklyn Bridge shooting as a clear act of terrorism. It was a very important day in the history, not just for Ari again personally, but it's, you know, it was, it demonstrated that, you know, what happened to my son didn't happen to him just in a random act of violence, but it was an attack with intent, deliberate. I authored these together with Governor Pataki and um, before 9-11, which
which was which is quite, which was quite quite significant and appointed to a commission on terrorism. Halberstam's crusade has made her a legend in law enforcement circles. She has advised and trained security officials on all aspects of terrorism. In 2009, Halberstam received a community leadership award from the FBI director's office. Despite all the accolades, she's particularly proud of her role in the creation of the Brooklyn Jewish Children's Museum, dedicated in memory of Ari. It is the umbrella for all children. It is my greatest joy to see every child walking through its doors, no matter where they come from. And what of the Brooklyn Bridge ramp that bears her son's name? Every child and every human being is sacred. That's what those signs tell you. If I do nothing else in my life, and it's really about everything that I do now, is about saving lives, it is the most important. For Independent Sources, I'm Nikki Miller. When we come back, exploring prejudice through theater. Finally from us, Rhapsody in Black is a one-man show starring Leland Gent and directed by Oscar winner and American Hall of Famer Estelle Parsons. The production spans Gent's life from his underprivileged childhood in Pennsylvania to his teenage dalliances with crime and drugs to his emergence as a black actor who is often the only person of color in the room. Zyphus Lerburn spoke with Gent about the production and why he thought it was important to start this conversation. So, Leland, thank you so much for joining us in the oh, studio today. Sure, yeah, my All pleasure. Right. So, let's talk a little bit about Rhapsody in Black. Yeah. Let's tell the audience, what, what, what is this all about? Rhapsody in Black is a treatise on racism. I'm trying to start a conversation uh, to try to clear up some things, uh, dispel some falsehoods, straighten out some misconceptions, you know, because uh, most folk uh, only know what they've heard or read about the other, whatever that other is. Most folk don't get an opportunity to really experience the other. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the tagline on the show is Tales from the Color Line. You know, I've spent so much time as the only black person among a lot of white folk, you know, and going back and forth from a white culture to a black culture and having the white culture affect me and taking that back home to where I'm not really down at home. So I'm straddling the two cultures. So I have a, a unique perspective, and I'm finding more and more that a lot of people have that perspective, but nobody wants to talk about it because mm -hmm. it's painful, you know, and you got to do a lot of soul searching. And to present this is kind of like opening yourself up. Right. As a performer, that's what I do, so right. that's that, what it's about. Right. Now, you talk about more and more people kind of straddling that line. What's been the response to this show so far? This show hits people between the eyes like, you know, Tyson, Muhammad Ali. Uh, it makes them question beliefs that they had held, uh, ideas that they have, uh, realigns a thought process. Um, I've had people tell me it's changed their life. You know, I had this brother, Iggy, come up to me after a show at the studio and said, man, look me in my face like, you changed my life. Man. And it's, it, it's what I want to do. It's really what I want to do. I want to plant a seed in somebody's consciousness so that it sprouts to a tree that bears fruit that everybody can eat. You know, that's what I want to do. Absolutely. All right. You know, we're talking about the show, but I want the audience to see um, what the show is all about. We're going to take in a clip from the judge, one of the uh, performances. Oh, yeah, 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 okay? yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, great. You can't come up with one good reason why I should not remand you to juvenile hall. It's because your mother loves you, son. A vision cracks open like a raw egg in my fear plate mind, spilling images of me tied to a folding chair in the middle of the living room, my mother wailing on me with an extension cord until she gets tired, desperately trying to save me from having to face this very moment in time. 
You should pay more attention to her. She's trying to give you a better life if you give her half a chance. Well, she's convinced me to take a chance on you. That's some good stuff. That's, Thanks. <laughs> that's some really heavy stuff. I mean, any, um, any kid knows about mom trying to, yeah. trying to set them straight. But that's only one of several performances. Can you tell us a little bit about the other performances, the other um, uh, vignettes? That's just a, 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 a clip from a scene that is the judge. And it's, it's part of a, a, a series where, you know, um, as a kid, I was looking for some place to be somebody, you know, to get that jolt of self-esteem so I could feel like I was. And uh, the first choice, you know, a lot of inner city kids is like, you know, you're you running around and you, you get that influence from crime, you know. You see the pimp, you see the gangster, you see the hustler, they got money, they got good clothes, you know. They're always running the streets. They seem to have this really kind of nice life. So I was seduced into a crime situation. Um, so that's what that is. That talks about that. There's other things about being the only black person in a group of white people. Uh, there's the idea about black on black racism. You know, what happens when your own folk, you know, don't feel like you, you're toeing the line. You know, the black police and stuff. I tell all of these stories giving you an idea about where I am when I receive my scene of instruction. And the scene of instruction has everything to do with that discriminatory sledgehammer that hits you in the head, whether it's because you have an accent, whether it's because you're in a wheelchair, whether it's because you're a black man or a woman. You know, discrimination takes all sorts of, you know, manifests in all, all kinds of ways. And I try to, to purvey a paradigm that will be emblematic of that, moving toward a transcendence. And I really believe uh, specifically racism, which is what I'm talking about, can be transcended if we just don't allow it free reign. Do you think that um, folks in the U.S. are ready to have a real conversation about race and racism and, and how it manifests? I think we're ready, you know, just like that child might be ready, but it's up to the parent to, you know, show the child how ready they are. To say that we have a black president, there's no more racism, that's not true. We have a black president, that means we're ready to have a conversation, you know, more ready than we ever have been. Um, Estelle Parsons, wh what's that been like working with her? Um, she has wonderful sight. You know, she, when, you, when you're working with, in a collaboration with an artist that tells you to do that, just that little adjustment, and it opens up a world of things, you want to you wanna work with that person. You know, that sight is incredible, it's invaluable. She is a completely incredible woman. I, I'm blessed to have had any, any kind of an association with her. Okay, so you know, they're telling me that we got to wrap soon, but I just got a couple quick questions for you. The show was in workshop at the Actors Studio. Where, where is it now? Right now I've been accepted to a uh, United Solo Festival. I'll be doing a presentation on the 27th of September. If I sell out those 65 seats early enough, they'll give me another show and another show. Every show I sell out, they'll give me another show up until eight shows. They have a window uh, the, 20, uh, the 18th of September through November 23rd. I've also applied to a couple of other you know, festivals. I'll find out about acceptance later in the, in, in the year. I'm going to be touring the Eastern Seaboard of uh, high schools and colleges and some theaters uh, starting after the first of the year and uh, vectoring toward uh, gaining momentum and creating a buzz that hopefully will deposit me off Broadway here in the city. All right, Leland, I wish you the best, man, and pleasure meeting you. Life is my right. pleasure, man. Take care. Thank you for having me. Yeah. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>